Okay, today uh, we're going to talk about audio for, for television or just audio in general. Uh, we'll do this, we'll start out with sound, okay? Part one. Sound is the vibration of air. Simply put, vibration of air, that's sound. As I speak, I thrust acoustical energy out of my body and I push the air in the room, vibrating the air molecules. Your eardrum is sensitive to those vibrations. Because I'm somewhat intelligent and I can make the same sound at will, and you're intelligent and you can predict, uh, you, can, you learn what those sounds mean, you know, letters, vowels, you know, consonants, you know, and, and, and relationship with a word and a, and a meaning. You know, we have language. But another way of putting it is sound is the compression balance and refraction or which is the opposite of compression and balance, again, of air. So these dots represent air molecules. So they're compressed on one side, then the air pressure is balanced on both sides, then it's refracted or refracted where the, where the air molecules are, are compressed on the opposite side of compression, and then they're balanced again. You could look at a guitar string, you could look at a rubber band, you know, and you could pluck that rubber band, you could see how f fast it vibrates back and forth. You cannot count those vibrations, it's so fast. So, sound is a, f when sound, when compression, balance, refraction, and balance happens in one second, it's called one, I didn't think it was that funny, it's called one cycle per second equals one hertz abbreviated at HZ. Hertz is uh, not the rental company car. <laughs> Hertz is a Heinrich Hertz was a scientist who you know, figured this out. Heinrich Hertz. That's why they call it one cycle per second. Compression, balance, refraction, balance. Compression, balance, refraction, balance. That's one cycle, four stage pattern in one second is called one Hertz or abbreviated as HZ. When you look at the audio console you'll see HZ You'll see 500 HZ. You'll see that's what they're talking about. 500 four cycle patterns. Okay. Here's the, here's the here's the trick. Human hearing is about 20 to 22,000 cycles per second. In other words, we really can't hear this one four stage pattern. We can't hear five four stage patterns. We can't hear ten four stage patterns. We have to hear at least 20 of these four stage patterns in one second for us to begin to hear a sound. And it's a very low in tone sound, pitch, a very low frequency sound. Sound is broken up into low frequencies, mid range, and high frequencies. Okay, low frequency. In other words, we could hear maybe 20,000 cycles a second, 21,000 cycles a second, but then it gets really, the vibrations, there's so many of them, it gets impossible to hear after a while with our own ears. And so we break these, or we categorize these, these frequencies into three distinct categories, low frequency, mid-range frequency, and high frequency. So roughly you could say low frequency is about 20,000 cycles to about 1,000 cycles a second and high frequency is about 16,000 cycles a second and up. I'll just write 22 to stick with my schematic, my numbers over here. And everything in the between is about 1,000 to 16,000 HC. Now, you know, different textbooks will categorize this differently. And we, but when you look at the equalizers, you'll see, on the equalizers, you'll see these numbers written out. But you notice about those numbers, uh, 20 to 1,000 that's 980 frequencies. And then above that, you have 1,000 to 16,000. 
and then above that you have 16,000 to 22,000. So the biggest category right here is this mid-range area, which uh, tests have, have shown that, mid, uh, that humans here mid-range are a lot better than high frequency and low frequencies. It's something that's called the Fletcher-Munson curve. The Fletcher-Munson curve, two scientists that worked for Bell Laboratories in the 1920s that figured this out. What they did is they created vibrations per second and they amplified it with the same amount of power and it, it achieved a certain volume. And then when they got to these numbers around here, between 1,000 and roughly 16,000 cycles a second, they noticed that the, the sound appeared to be much louder, much louder than the lower frequencies or these higher frequencies. So we didn't explain it. But, you know, it's the same electricity, the same amount of power. They amplified the sound. So basically you have a, a curve of hearing where your human hearing is over here. And low frequencies, uh, I'm sorry, high frequencies down here, low frequencies down here, and mid-range frequencies up here. In other words, you hear mid-range frequency real easy, but all these other frequencies are really difficult to hear, and that's the Fletcher-Munson curve. So the goal was to look at this and then invert the curve, change the curve. And what they did was they changed the curve like this. How they changed the curve is they, they invented equalizers. So the human hearing would be over here, and now the low frequencies are much higher, the high frequencies are, are much higher, the, and the mid-range frequencies are much lower. Just don't shut the door. <laughs> just, yeah, don't shut the door all the way. Just, just keep it. Right. So in other words, it, it's a lot easier to hear high fr uh, low frequencies and high frequencies because of equalization. And what they ended up doing is actually subtracting the mid-range frequencies because they're so easy to hear. And so why is that? That's because humans uh, developed, evolved this way over years and years and years. All the sounds our bodies make are mid-range frequencies, are in the mid-range area. Our speech and all other sounds we make are in this mid-range frequency area. So it makes sense for us to develop acute hearing in mid-range frequencies. In other words, we could understand, we detect slight differences in mid-range uh, uh, changes, mid-range frequencies. But low frequencies and high frequencies, we really can't detect much. I mean, don't get me wrong, if you, if you turn up the bass style on your stereo, it sounds big and fat, and you understand. That's, you know, if you take the tone control, it sounds clear and crisp. That's the high end, right? But, the, you know, that's all you really can do with it, you know? The mid-range, however, you, it's the, the mid-range in and of itself is separated to low mid-range, mid-range, and high frequency mid-range, okay? Because human voice is tracked in that area. Now, let me explain that to you a little bit further. Each sound is made up of, 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 of hundreds, if not thousands, of frequencies. Now, how is that possible? I could demonstrate by just using my hand on the board. You listen to that sound. There are just there are several sounds right there. There's a slapping sound of my flesh hitting the board. There's a metallic sound of my ring hitting the board. There's a thumping sound too of my, my hand hitting the board. And I'll do it again. Right? There are three distinct sounds there. My ring, the slapping of my hand, and the thumping of my hand. And each those three distinct sounds are made up of hundreds of thousands of frequencies. So if you record that sound and put it through an equalizer and isolate frequencies, you could add volume at certain frequencies and subtract volume at other frequencies, changing the overall characteristic of the sound, thus making a firecracker sound like a big cannon or making a tiny voice or a tiny sound making deep or, or, making, or, or powerful. You follow my point? Okay. So there's two types of equalizers. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, a graphic equalizer. And there's a parametric equalizer, EQ, OK? The graphic equalizer works on a full spectrum, basically, of sound, full spectrum, where this is the parametric is just mid-range. And so if you look at a slide fader equalizer, you've seen these in magazines. And in fact, I'll send you guys a handout electronically that'll illustrate this as well. What's that? What does it say under full spectrum? Just mid-range. 
Okay, and there's these dials on this. You've seen this, maybe some of you have this in your cars or you have it on your computer and you'd adjust these faders up and down and the sound changes, right? You know what I'm talking about? You've seen this before. Now what's going on is to the left of this, there are numbers. Minus three, minus six, minus nine, minus 12, plus three, plus six, plus nine, plus 12, et cetera. And I'm, I'm making this up right now. It could be different manufacturers, you know, have different controls. So what you're doing is when you raise this dial above the zero point, you're adding volume. And when you lower the vol this dial below the zero point, you're subtracting volume at this frequency that this fader is set up to control. What, fre what frequency it's set up to control is written right here. This may say 500 HZ. This may say 700 HZ. This may say 1,000 HZ. Well, instead of saying HZ, it'll say 1K to use the metric system. You follow my point? So each fader will control a certain group of frequencies. And if you raise that fader above the halfway mark, which is zero, you're adding volume at that frequency. And if you, you, you lower the fader at that frequency, you know, at the, you know, below here, you're subtracting volume at that frequency. So like I said, the sound you hear, any sound you hear is made up of hundreds if not thousands of frequencies. And, uh, and if you record the sound, and then you put it through an equalizer, and then you start to adjust the, the, frequency, you know, the frequency sliders, you'll basically change the overall characteristics of a sound, making a small sound sound large, making a fat sound sound thin, sound tiny. And like I said, there's two types of equalizers. And it'll tell you on the top, it'll say graphic right on the equalizer itself. Even if it's a computer program and it opens up, it'll say graphic right on there. But you know what a graphic equalizer does. In other words, the frequency select is starting in the low, in the lows, and it ends up, you know, in the highs, you know, up here. It ends up, you know, and it groups a bunch of frequencies together as it gets to, from the low frequency all the way up to the high frequency. But each fader works the same exact way. It's just a, a, adjusting a, a group of frequencies within that area. A parametric equalizer, it'll say parametric on it, and the numbers will not start that low. The numbers will start in the mid-range area. If it says parametric, the numbers will start like around, around what did I say, around 1,000? Like 1K, and it'll end up around 16K. And you say, hey, wait a minute, there's a they're, they're, they're not... <coughs> They're not listing a bunch of low frequencies or a bunch of high frequencies. So right away, that tells you, oh, this, this equalizer is a parametric equalizer. But if you don't pick up on that, it'll tell you it'll, on the equalizer itself. It'll be written right there. It makes sense to have an equalizer that just uh, tweaks or adjusts mid-range frequencies because we're so, we, we hear mid-range frequencies so well that any little change in a mid-range frequency, we detect right away. Like, you know, there are three female, four, five females sitting, six females sitting right here in my purview. You all have different voices. They say, of course they have different voices. You know, if I turn my back, you know, and you talk, I'd probably be able to tell which one is which. Because it's, it's, there's, there's slight differences in mid-range frequencies. The same thing with Ben. I put a bunch of guys together, I get to know their voices, then I turn my back and they'll talk, and I'll be able to pick out, choose which voice belongs to who or whom. <laughs> okay. uh, that's because I could detect very subtle changes in mid-range frequencies. You know, that sounds very different, you know, very, very different. Your voice sounds very, very different than your voice. It's because we're able to detect these changes in mid-range frequencies. That's because we've evolved that way over the years of evolution. Our ears have evolved to pick up subtle changes in mid-range frequencies because the sounds our bodies make are in the mid-range register. Babies crying, people talking, et cetera, all the sounds our bodies make are in the mid-range frequencies. Uh, you know, animals make sounds in other, other registers, other frequencies. Animals, you know, birds and whales and dolphins, they communicate and, you know, they make all these high-pitched squeak, squeaking sounds that make no sense to us, but they seem to understand what's going on, right? It's a much higher frequency range than 22,000 cycles a second. Our ears are hard, didn't develop to pick up sound, you know. Even 22,000 is very difficult. I, I, most humans, their, their hearing drops off around 20,000 cycles a second. And it doesn't even go down to 500 cycles a second. I'm sorry, uh, to 20, cycle, 20 cycles a second. It, it probably kicks in around 100, 100, 200 cycles a second. Then all of a sudden, you start to feel this rumble, this low end, 
you know, f shaking or, or feeling, you know, thunder and, and, and bass and, and, uh, and rumbling, earthquake, that's all that stuff that's really low frequency, uh, as opposed to high frequency, s screeching, a car brake screeching, electric guitar, you know, hissing noises, uh, you know. Uh, those are high frequency sounds. So you ask yourself, why am I going, why am I explaining this whole thing, how we hear and human hearing, you know, mid-range frequencies, uh, because this is, sets the stage for microphones. The next part is microphones. Now, if you're, you know, if you're an advanced audiophile, then you know, like, there's more to this. But right now, three basic microphones. Okay? You got your moving coil, or, or it's known as dynamic. You got your uh, uh, ribbon microphone. And then you got your uh, condenser. Condenser microphone. And the base, the difference in the microphones is in the diaphragm, this, the thing in the microphone that vibrates. Okay? So let's look at the moving coil or dynamic microphone. A cross section of that. I'll draw a quick cross. There's a microphone. Make, don't make fun of my artwork. <laughs> That's the windscreen. The windscreen is the ball on the tip of the microphone. It's like a mesh. And it's just metal. That's all it is. And if you unscrew it, inside is, is uh, cushion. Like, you know, stuff that you know, put in a pillow. Cushion, you know. And what that's supposed to do is supposed to soften the acoustical energy that comes in from the front of the microphone before it gets to the diaphragm. Because as you speak, you have to create a lot of energy sometimes to, get to, pr to pronounce certain words. So, for example, if you speak and you put your hand in front of your mouth, as you speak the words, you notice to make certain sounds, you'll feel the air hit your hand for the letters P or the letters B or the letters S or the letters K. Let it F feel, you'll feel the air hitting your hand. You have to get a lot of air and thrust it out of your body. You contort your vocal cords, make them narrow or, or wide to, to make the, the pitch high or lower. And what happens is all that air comes out of your body and it hits your hand. And so certain sounds, to create certain sounds, you have to throw out a lot of air and other sounds to pronounce. You don't need to throw out a lot of air. So this windscreen with the felt or, or the cushion inside of the windscreen is to prevent the high pressure air to, from distorting the diaphragm, which is suspended within the magnetic field. But let me, let me show you. Let's do a magnet first. A magnet, like a horseshoe magnet, OK? And then we're going to North Pole and the South Pole, OK? Now, you know when you have a North Pole and South Pole, you know when you take two magnets off your refrigerator and sometimes they want to stick together and you try to reverse one and it doesn't stick together, right? You've seen that happen. And you could actually push one magnet across the table if, if, if you have two alike poles, two north poles will repel each other, two south poles will repel each other, and you can put the two magnets on the table and you can push one across the table without ever touching it from the magnetic field. And then you flip it over, and what happens? They, they touch, they want to stay together. The north pole and the south pole stay together. So if you hold the north pole and south pole just slightly apart, what you have existing between there is a magnetic field. Okay. And if you could try to put a paper clip between there, and you can move the paper clip with the two magnets, but it's very difficult to do because the paper clip is going to want to jump to one side or jump to the other side. But you could do it. You, you can do it if you're really careful. So what you have here is a field of attraction. Why I'm, why I'm mentioning this example to you is to prove that you know that something exists there, even though you can't see it. You know there's a field of attraction. There's a magnetic field of attraction, even though it's, you don't see it, just by taking those two magnets and trying to hold them apart. And when you let go, they don't fall on the floor. What happens? They, they touch, and then they fall on the floor, right? So what we have next is a diaphragm, which is suspended within, within the magnetic field, and there's a coil of wire wrapped around it. There's a bigger, that would be a bigger, uh, a bigger version of it. So as you speak into this diaphragm, it's like a, uh, it's like a very thin, thin plastic. It's very, very, you know, your air, the air that's coming out of your body will vibrate this diaphragm really, very quickly. But what's the back of the diaphragm has a coil of wire wrapped around it. And so what happens is your air is vibrating this diaphragm really fast inside this magnetic field with a coil of wire wrapped around it. 
So if you have a, a metallic or a metal object, a mag magnetic object, suspended within the magnetic field and it's moving really fast, it creates electricity. That's how electricity is created. You know, we, nuclear power, whatever you want to call it, it still uses, you know, moving a magnetic object in and out of a magnetic field really fast. <laughs> You know, on a river, you have a, you have a wheel in the, in the water that's turning, and the, the, the wheel is hooked up to a, a, a metal object which is moving in and out of a magnetic field really fast, generating electricity. Uh, you, know, you boil water, the water makes steam, the steam turns a propeller, and the propeller moves an object in and out of a magnetic field really fast. That's creating electricity. You know, nuclear power is just that. The plutonium is so very hot, they have to cool it with water, the water uh, boils, the water creates steam, the steam turns a propeller, a turbine, creates electricity. The whole point with nuclear power though, you have to keep it cool because those rods will superheat and melt through the earth. So you always have to keep cool you know, water over there. As the water, vibra as the water dissipates, it evaporates, it turns into steam, you have to continue to fill it with new water. But anyway, so, but, so you're taking acoustical energy, your voice, the air that's coming out of your existence, your life, your body, that air, and vibrating this diaphragm back and forth. And on this diaphragm is a coil of wire that's wrapped around it. And that wire is moving really fast back and forth in the magnetic field. And those electronic pulses are, are picked up through the, X, through the cable, the video cable, and it goes off to the audio console. Those pulses Every time it makes a pulse or a vibration, it gets picked up to the cable, goes through the audio console. And that's basically it. You're taking acoustical energy, acoustic energy, and turning it into electricity. That's what the microphone is doing. It's taking acoustical energy and turning it into electricity. A speaker cabinet, a speaker, is taking electrical energy and turning it back into acoustical energy. That's so when you watch a speaker, you take the grill off a speaker cabinet, and you play the music, you see the speaker vibrates. Yeah. What's how the electricity is causing that speaker to move thousands and thousands of times per second, okay? Pushing air that's right in front of it and making vibrations in the room. It's the same thing. It's the same thing, only in reverse. When I talk about these microphones, I'm going to list a couple of categories. For example, you have cost, you have uh, usage, use, use, and then cost, usage, use, and uh, oh, a frequency response. So cost about $100, a moving coil microphone, a, a good one about $100, now, even less than that, $80. Use, uh, it's really tough. In other words, you could take it in the cold environment, you could take it outside, you could take it in the, in the warm environment, you could drop it on the floor, you know, it's pretty much, it's not going to break. Uh, Frequency response is good. I would categorize it as good. What I mean by good is, let's get over here again, it records a lot of low frequencies, a lot of mid-range frequencies, and a lot of high frequencies. It doesn't record the full spectrum of our, of our hearing, but it, it does reproduce a, a very large range, okay? The next thing would be the, the, uh, the ribbon microphone, which the difference is the diaphragm. You want to draw another microphone in your, your notebook, feel free to do so. But the difference here is the diaphragm. You have a, a metallic shaped ribbon suspended within a magnetic field. I'll draw it over here bigger so you can see it. It's a rectangular piece of metal which engineers said, oh, it looks like a hair ribbon. So they call it a hair, a ribbon microphone. This thing is suspended by two delicate wires in the magnetic field. And because it's suspended by two delicate wires, it's very fragile. It's very fragile. Okay? Uh, they're cheaper nowadays, 200 plus. But, you know, there are good ones that are $50,000, the ones that Elvis Presley used to record, you know, and, you know. The reason is this microphone records low frequency. It reproduces low frequencies really well. It doesn't reproduce high frequencies well. So if I were to give this talk with a ribbon microphone and then you play that talk back, you would hear my voice appearing to sound different or lower in pitch than it is. Because yeah, it only, it's only recording the low frequencies and not the high frequencies that make up my voice. Doesn't it really depend 
depend on what kind of living that you have? Yeah. Like yeah. I mean, today in 2017, okay. we were splitting hairs because, like I said, up until a couple of years ago, you couldn't touch a ribbon microphone for $250. Now, they've used that technology to create a ribbon microphone at that price. But, you know, the older ribbon microphones, you know, depending on the brand, and okay. yeah, exactly, they, they're different. You know, they record uh, different frequencies, and you have to look at the specifications and see what frequencies they reproduce and what frequencies they don't reproduce. But getting back to television, uh, it's the first microphone developed. It's, you could recognize it because it's usually very large. And the reason why it's large is because the diaphragm is large. That ribbon is large. You know, it's about probably about that big in there, okay, vibrating back and forth. Uh, it's the first microphone, it's the most expensive microphone, it records low frequencies, and you see it on the desks of talk show hosts as a prop, and it works. They have it plugged in, and it's plugged in, it's really very low, okay? Uh, it's, and, and it's not really a ribbon microphone anymore, it's a dynamic moving coil microphone that was modeled after a ribbon microphone. Because you remember, a talk show host is in front of a live audience, people are cheering and yelling and screaming, and that could very easily damage a real ribbon microphone because the burst of acoustical energy. So the newer ones you see on the talk show host desk are really dynamic microphones made to look like ribbon microphones. What it is, it's a, a big ribbon, a big, a big diaphragm in that microphone, so it reproduces low frequencies really well, but it doesn't reproduce high frequencies that well, and it makes the voice sound warmer or richer. Okay, a lot of the first microphones were used that way. Uh, the, the first audio uh, recording people, the radio disc jockeys, they like to use this microphone. And today, in recording studios, vocal performers like to use these microphones because they make, uh, they record the low frequencies and it makes their voice sound really warm and sexy. Uh, you know, it has a raspy sound to it. Uh, it reproduces the low frequencies, not the high frequencies. Again, you're listening to my voice, and you have to realize my voice is made up of thousands of frequencies. Now, and if you, have, if you had the power just to subtract some of those frequencies, my voice ends up sounding different in the recording because of that. So a ribbon microphone would do that. It would subtract. You, you won't hear the, hiss, the, the, the S's and the hissing in my voice. You would only hear the low frequencies. My voice would appear to sound much deeper or lower in tone because you're only hearing the low frequencies, like a low-pass filter. A low-pass filter would only pass low frequencies and not pass high frequencies. It's the same thing, really. But it's like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite costly. It's quite, uh, the real ones are quite costly, and uh, you know, $10,000, $15,000, $25,000. They're quite delicate, and they record low frequencies really well. The last but not least is a condenser microphone. Again, you can start at about $250 and, and up. Uh, it's strong and uh, really good, good frequency response. Really good frequency response. What I mean by that is it records most most of the spectrum you want here. It records a lot of lows, a lot of highs, records mid-range, it really does. And again, different microphones have different specifications of design for different purposes, but this condenser microphone is strong, it records good frequencies, and it's really very popular to use, but the, the issue with a condenser microphone is it has, it has sort of like two diaphragms. It's really not two diaphragms, but it's a good way to remember it. So you have a, a front a front diaphragm, and they have something back here called a back plate. And what happens is the energy, or the acoustical energy coming in from the front of the microphone is interpreted as positive energy. This back plate has a negative charge. And then what do you get with positive and negative? They want to attract each other. So as, as this air comes in through the front of the vi microphone, it vibrates the, the diaphragm, and it's still being attracted to hit this back plate and how long it hits the back plate, how quickly it hits the back plate, how, how, what's the duration, has a lot to do with the characteristic of that, of that vibration, of that electronic pulse that gets sent through the audio console. Now, here, here's the thing. To create a negative charge on this back plate, you need a power supply. You need a power supply. There's two types of power supplies. There's a visible power supply, I like to call it, and there's an invisible power supply. Okay. So the visible power supply is simply you know, a battery. This microphone will hook up to a battery, or maybe the microphone cylinder will come apart, and you drop a battery in it, okay, and uh, that'll, that'll power the back plate 
That's, that's a visible power supply. And then there's other things like an invisible power supply where it's getting its power from the audio console through the audio cable right into the microphone. That's called phantom power. That's called phantom power. Phantom, think of phantom as what? A spirit, a ghost, invisible, phantom. So it's phantom power. Uh, so it's getting, you can't, there's no battery. You can't see this power where it's coming from. It's coming from the audio console, through the audio cable, to the microphone to charge that pad plate. However, you have to make sure that the microphone you're using is compatible with the audio console. Is the audio console putting out phantom power on each of the channels? It may not be. Or if it is, you have to make sure it's compatible with the microphone. But once you get that issue in the licked, once you get that settled, it's really a very good microphone to use. And now, like in, in the 2000s, you know, in 2005, it's now we've kind of gotten away from this. It's, made, it's, it's been a lot easier to use condenser microphones on location because before, with all, this, with all these other things you'd have to consider, it's a lot easier to use it in the studio. But now, with phantom power, you have an audio console that has phantom power on it. The power gets sent through the audio cable, and you could record, you know, you could use those microphones in a live recording environment with a band or whatever. And it, remember, the advantage is it gives you a much better frequency response. It records much better low frequencies, mid range frequencies, and high frequencies, you know, than the dynamic moving coil. The dynamic moving coil is really very good, but not really not as, as good. It doesn't record or reproduce as many frequencies as a condenser microphone. Okay? And the ribbon microphone, you know, ribbon microphones are very fragile, so you only use it in a controlled environment in the studio. Okay. So you got two types of power supplies with this condenser microphone. You have a visible power supply where you can see the power. It's a battery or the, or the microphone plugs into a, a, a box of some kind and the output of that box goes into the audio console and there's another part, part of that box plugs into a wall. Electricity it gets its electricity. And then you have the invisible power supply which is like ooh, ghost-like, invisible, phantom. That's called phantom powered microphone, meaning it's getting its power from the audio console. If the audio console is rated to send power through the audio, through the audio cable into the microphone. Okay. So that's a little tricky there, but, you know, in the le any questions with this before I move on to the last part of this? <laughs> the last part is pickup patterns. Pickup patterns. And it's basically four, really six pickup patterns we're using intelligent. I'm going to move it along, uh, I guess I'll come back here. So this, you know, remember compression balance, refraction balance, that's what's happening inside of here, right here. And that's what's happening on your speaker when you're playing back from your speaker, compression balance, refraction balance. And the last thing, the so sound was one, Fletcher Munson curve was two, oh yeah, there you go, basic microphones, okay. is pickup patterns. Uh, Pickup patterns. What you got is four pickup patterns. Remember them that this way. Unidirectional. Okay. You got two, you have bidirectional. Three, you have something called cardioid. And four, you have omni. Remember them this way. You, one is uni. It means one. The word, what? Like I'm sorry. Like I didn't hear you. Mind. No, say it again. Yeah. Is it like pencil? Like, I don't. Okay. Like I don't understand. Okay. We'll get to it. unidirectional. Picks up sound. The word uni means one, so it picks up sound in one direction. Simple as that. The word by means what? It means two, right? So it picks up sound in two directions, right? I'll skip that one. Number four, omni, if you look it up, it means everything, all inclusive, all around. So that picks up sound in all directions, right? This word cardioid, it sounds like, what is that word cardioid? What does it remind me of cardioid? Cardi, cardi, cardi. Cardiac, cardio, yeah. It's heart, right? heart related. So it's a heart shaped pickup pattern, okay? Okay. So if you have a microphone, for example, Let's do a microphone. Unidirectional would be like this, in one direction. It only, it's only picking up sound entering from the top of the microphone. So I'm speaking in the microphone. The pickup pattern is over here.
okay? Not over here. So as soon as I move the microphone away from my mouth, there's going to be a significant drop in sound. So, so what do you think of the weather in New York City? You know, as I, as I move away, and I come back, and as it comes back, my voice gets louder all of a sudden. So unidirectional. Bidirectional picks up sound of the rear of the microphone. Now, the, the, remember I said the top of the <coughs> microphone is a ball. And so what happens is sound frequencies are coming in from the bottom, too. And if they're the same frequencies that are coming in from the top, they get canceled out. And if there are different frequencies coming than the top, they get passed through. It's a bidirectional pickup pattern microphone. Uh, the cardioid is a heart shape, but it's an upside down heart shape. Okay, so the microphone's here. Upside down was my heart. Bad heart. There you go. <laughs> heart shape. So it's an upside down heart. That's your cardioid. So it's really strong here, it's strong here, it's strong out here, it's strong up here. So a cardioid pickup pattern, here's your microphone. It's strong in 360 degrees over here. And it's strong over here, too. But it's not strong over here. And the last one, omnidirectional, picks up sound in all directions. With a little bit of a drop off on the bottom, but it's omni. This is cardioid. Okay. And you say, well, why would I, you know, there's these different, you know, different pickup patterns, and why would I use these different pickup patterns? They're for different applications. Unidirectional is very, it's very helpful in, in live stage unidirectional, because if you got an instrument here and you got an instrument there, you have microphones of both instruments, well if you use a unidirectional microphone, it's a lot easier for the person that's, that's mixing the sound, he or she doesn't get leakage from one sound into the other person's microphone. It is very difficult to distinguish what sound is coming where. Would you use the cardio line for like a chorus when there's yeah, that could work too, but more, more an omni would work better. What I'm wearing here is a cardio pickup pattern. This lavalier thing, this microphone I have, and this little, this is a condenser microphone with a back plate and everything. Okay, it's a wireless microphone too. It's conden you know, but uh, it's a cardio pickup pattern. The pickup pattern is going like this. It's going like, so it picks up sound over here, picks up sound over here. It's going like that. Uh, bidirectional, we took a. Bidirectional, uh, like I said, it, it's used in a situation when you have two people talking and you have to move the microphone back and forth because that person's frequencies are different than yours and it's, gonna be, uh, it's, it's not going to be rejected by the microphone. Uh, cardioid, we talked about cardioid, omni, all around. They use this mostly the, the, when the reporters are in the street doing interviews with people on camera, that you have that microphone, they're moving back and forth on camera. That's an omnidirectional microphone. That picks up sound in all directions. Because it's news, they want to try and capture the environment. So there's a fire on Broadway here up in Dobbs Ferry. So you hear you know, the fire truck in the background, and you, you see the workers, you hear the workers working. But the loudest sound on that microphone is going to be what's closest to the microphone. It's called proximity miking. You know, whatever is closest to the microphone is going to be the loudest one. It's going to be the loudest sound. So you use an omnidirection microphone. Or like I said, in your environment, what you were talking about, maybe, maybe on stage, uh, I think the, you, you would experiment the cardio pick a pattern or an omnidirectional pick a pattern. You know, cardio might work in that, like three three people singing. You know, it might. Good, you have a question? Because of the feedback. Because of the feedback, yeah. you would cause feedback mm -hmm. from um, omnidirectional cause feedback. Yeah. yeah, because you have other things on stage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was acapella. I don't know what she's doing. I agree with you. That's that's a good point. So so I think I think cardio might be your best bet to go along with that if you have three people singing on one microphone. Now I said earlier, I said there's really six picket patterns I'm going to be discuss discussing that for because there are two offshoots of the cardioid. There's two offshoots of the cardioid which relate directly to television. There's a supercardioid and there's a hyper. And this deals with really uh, uh, shotgun microphones. In other words, on television or in film, people are performing, they're acting. And you don't see the microphone in the shot because you don't want to see the microphone in the shot. So you have two people, you know, talking you know, in the street, and there's a camera across the street recording, they're, they're walking, but there's somebody over here with a microphone holding it over their head and following their, you know, listening and pointing the microphone directly at their mouths so they can pick up the sound coming out of their mouths. So the sound, the pickup pattern has to be really deep, really far. So a supercardioid pickup pattern, for example, if that's the microphone, a supercardioid pickup pattern might be 
might be maybe 15 feet, whereas a hypercardioid might be like 25 feet, depending on the specifications of the manufacturer. I don't know. They come different ways. So. Is it hypercardioid when it's regular cardioid and then it has a really high pickup and is very bad? It, it would work. And then that's more like the human I'm sorry, I don't no, I, no, I think hypercardioid is just the, the depth of the pickup pattern. You know, I gotta look into that. Maybe, yeah. maybe. It's like it's like regular cardioid, but it just has a huge spike in the very back. You're talking about you're talking about. If, so if you got like this, and, you, and you're saying there's a bigger yeah. in the back, mm -hmm. but the depth of of the point of the hypercardioid is usually longer than the supercardioid. Because even supercardioids have that back area. But the depth, how far you can shoot across. That's more unidirectional, isn't it? I can't hear you. What? That's more unidirectional, isn't it? No, this is for shotgun, shotgun miking. Shotgun miking. When you're miking in conversation, let's say Dan is having a conversation over there, I need a, 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 a supercarpal cardioid or a hypercardioid to pick up the sound that far out. No, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. <laughs> Uh, so it's really, and the last thing are the RF microphones, which no one asked the question, the radio frequency microphones. Stand for radio frequency microphones, radio frequency microphones. Which means, as you see people on stage with a microphone, it's a transmitter. And it transmits a signal to a receiver off stage, which is picking up that, and that gets wired into the audio console. That's an RF microphone. A battery goes in this compartment. And that battery operates the transmitter. It allows it to transmit at a certain frequency, and then it's being picked up off stage by a receiver. Transmitter. Okay, basically what I'm wearing right now is I'm wearing an RF microphone. It's I got a microphone on me. It's it's got a it's transmitting to the camera, to the receiver back there. Uh, and it, there's, a, there's a battery in here which is powering the receiver. Uh, that, I'm sorry, the powering the transmitter, and, and the receiver's got a battery in it which is picking up, you know, the signals. That's an RF microphone, radio frequency microphone. Don't get it. it wh what type of diaphragm? It's dynamic. D Y N. It's dynamic moving coil, what's going on, you know. This one, though, is a condenser, the one I'm wearing. But most of the time, the ones on stage are dynamic. But nowadays, again, in, in, in the latest developments are using condenser microphones that are RF microphones on stage because, you know, they're more sophisticated. They reproduce a greater amount of frequencies. OK, any questions or comments? Ta-da. <laughs> All right, then we're done. Thank you.